Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you all to our 11th session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Furqan and alhamdulillah we've reached uh, verse number 36 in the previous verses there was a discussion about uh, paradise and the the various blessings uh, within paradise and now with verse 36 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then speaks about uh, the hellfire. So verse 36, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, wal-ladhina kafaru lahum naru jahannama la yuqda alayhim fayamutu, wa la yukhaffafu anhum min athabiha, kathalika najzi kulla kafur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for those who disbelieve, theirs shall be the fire of hell. They shall neither be done away with so as to die, nor will the punishment be lightened for them. Thus do we recompense every stubborn rejecter. Now, in the Quran, you find that there are many verses where Allah subhanahu in almost all cases, you'll see that alongside any description of hellfire, you'll see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will balance it out with a, a description of uh, paradise and vice versa. If paradise is mentioned, hellfire will be mentioned alongside it. And therefore you see that the Quran consistently evokes the emotions of fear and hope in human beings. So in the invitation, in the Quranic invitation to guidance, you see these two elements, the element of hope and the element of fear. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the vivid descriptions of Jannah, you see that, and the promise of reward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, evokes this, this hope and this desire for that reward. And he invokes, he evokes the, the emotion of fear through the threat of punishment and the painful chastisements in the hereafter. And this is in accordance with the primordial nature of the human being, the fitrah of the human being, because human beings are born with this this self-love, which is known as hub with that, the love of the self. And human beings operate on this basis. They, they operate on this basis in the sense that they strive to do that which benefits them. And they also make an effort to guard themselves, to repel harm from reaching them. So all human beings have this in them. It's ingrained in them. Hub with that. In fact, even someone, uh, you know, ironically, even someone who takes their own lives, someone who commits suicide, even that is seen as an act of, at least in their minds, someone who commits suicide doesn't hate themselves. In fact, the reason why they end their lives is because they, they don't want to suffer anymore. And because... They love themselves. They want to rid themselves of that pain and of that suffering. So the love of the self is, is ingrained in all of us. And you see that in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us, that Allah evokes these emotions of hope and fear, which are essentially rooted in, uh, in this, uh, this, this love of the self. Now, as we mentioned in the verses before verse number 36, there was a discussion about some of the, some aspects of paradise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in ayah number 36, he transitions to a description of the hellfire. You know, some of the, the most dreadful realities of Jahannam. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمِ now, I want you to pay attention to 
the wording that is used here. As for those who disbelieve, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمْ For them, you know, when the Quran says, لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمْ It conveys this idea that hell belongs to them, that it's theirs, that there is a, a very close relationship between hellfire and those who stubbornly and arrogantly turn away from the truth. وَالَّذِينَ كَفُرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمْ So hell belongs to them. Not in an arbitrary sense. You know, in, in, you know, in the world today, when we think of prison and a prisoner, they are two distinct realities. The prisoner has a separate identity from the prison. But with hellfire, as we've alluded to in our previous discussions, hell is not, is not like that. It's not this you know, place that has an independent reality. Hell belongs to them because it is the product of their actions and a reflection of their souls. Meaning, hell cannot exist independently of them. And this is an important reality to understand. That Jahannam cannot independently exist without these wicked people. So it belongs to them. When Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمْ That as for those who disbelieve, theirs shall be the fire of hell. What it means is that they belong to each other. They cannot be separated from each other. So Jahannam belongs to them in the same way that a thought belongs to the thinker. So when you generate a thought in your mind, that thought cannot exist independently of you because the, the thought is the product of the thinker. And therefore, Jahannam cannot exist without these evil doers. Because, you know, as the Quran says, you know, فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَ That be cautious, that fear a hellfire whose fuel is people and stones. So you see that people are the fuel of Jahannam. And the idea that they are the creators of, uh, of this awful reality. Now, of course, no words can, can really convey the reality of Jahannam. It's something that, that has to be experienced. But the idea here is that Jahannam cannot exist independently of these wicked people because Jahannam is essentially the product of their actions. It's a reflection of of their souls. And hell, in essence, is the external, the physical manifestation of being distant from God. So that, that miserable place is, what it is, is, is that people in that world become keenly aware of their own reality. So someone who has distanced themselves from God, they've actually created hell for themselves because he is the source of, of peace and security. So hell is, in reality, the physical manifestation of being distant from, from God. So, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمْ Now, one of the most awful aspects of, of hell is that it, it doesn't end in the sense that there is no relief from it through death. لا يقضى عليهم فيموتوا. They don't, they don't die. 
Now, the Quran speaks about the physical and the psychological torments of, of hell. So in the same way that paradise has its spiritual bounties and its physical pleasures, hellfire also contains punishments for the body and pun punishments for the mind and the and the soul so the physical and the psychological torture of hell can annihilate a person but the reason what prevents them from from perishing is god's decree you know under normal circumstances the the agony and the suffering of of jahannam would cause them to die but because of the divine decree to keep them alive they remain alive so la yuqda alayhim so they don't they don't die and they don't perish because after death after the first death there is no more death we are eternal beings so there are several verses in the Quran which describe a sort of intermediate intermediate state between living and death. So just one one verse from Surah 87 verses 12 and 13, الذي يصل النار الكبرى, and then here Allah describes their condition in hell. ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا. So those who enter the greatest fire, some have understood the greatest fire to mean Jahannam, and others say that the greatest fire is the worst part of Jahannam. ثُمَّ لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا وَلَا يَحْيَا That they neither die, so they're not dead, but they're also not alive in the sense that they're not, there's no enjoyment. ثُمَّ لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا وَلَا يَحْيَا And this is, you know, similar to, you know, uh, a saying of, of the Arabs, which which is to say that, you know, I'm neither living nor am I dead. And this was a common expression among Arabs to indicate that someone is suffering immensely. That because of the quality of your life is so poor, it cannot be said that you're living because the quality of your life is so poor. And you're not dead because your your soul hasn't departed your body. So you're not dead nor are you living may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us so a person is not enjoying any aspect of living nor are they given a way out in the form of death so that's that's the condition of the people uh, in jahannam and some have said that this is a reference to the worst part of jahannam where they're neither living and enjoying any aspect of what it means to be alive nor do they perish and escape that uh, that chastisement so they don't die there is no you know in, there is no escape wala yukhaffafu anhum min adabiha nor will the punishment be lightened for them so you don't get used to it. You know, sometimes you're suffering, but then after some time, you start to adjust. You become acclimated. You develop thick skin and it becomes a little bit more bearable because of how long you've been there or you've, because you've adjusted. Allah says, nor will the punishment be lightened for them. So the inmates of Jahannam they have no hope in being annihilated. So there's no escape from the suffering through death. Nor is there, nor is there any hope that the punishment may be reduced. So you can only imagine how awful their, their condition is. Now, this is not arbitrary. Now, you may say that, okay, why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite mercy, why doesn't he reduce the, the punishment. Again, this is not something that's arbitrary. 
There is a re in the same way there, there's a reason why they enter hell. And there's also a reason why the punishment is not reduced. And it is, and this is something that's related to the souls of these people. Now, punishment is in accordance with the spiritual disease. The, it's, it's a reflection of the condition of their souls. Now, since there is no change or improvement in the condition of their souls, the, the punishment is, is not decreased. You know, and this is why we have that, that famous line in Dua Kumayl, where Imam Amir al muminin he speaks about a certain category of people who are eternally damned in hell. The overwhelming majority of people will not, will not dwell in the hellfire forever. Most people, you know, one you could even say that 99% of human beings, after some time, they will be admitted into paradise. But there are a certain group of people who, who are known as, as, as Imam Miran, وَأَن تُخَلِّدَ فِيهَا الْمُعَانِدِينَ that Allah has decreed that this, the, the mu'anideen, the stubborn ones, they are the ones who will remain in the hellfire. And to be stubborn means that, means that you there's no change. So because there is no internal change, because their souls have not changed, even after the punishment, the punishment is not reduced because the punishment is commensurate with the condition of their souls. And because there is no improvement in the condition of their souls, the punishment is not lessened. You know, if you think, even if you think of, of about pathology, you know, if you have a disease, the, the suffering that is associated with that disease is not going to change unless your condition improves. So unless your condition improves, the uh, you know the symptoms perhaps will remain the same. So since there is no change or improvement in the condition of their souls, the punishment is not decreased. And there are some people, as Amir al Mumini mentions in Dua Kumayl, that there are some people, and it's it's really hard for us to even fathom this, that there are some people who are so stubborn that even the punishment of Jahannam doesn't cause any real change in them. It's only a superficial change. There's no real change that's happening. If you go to uh, Surah, uh, Surah An-Nisa, verse 56, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again gives us another glimpse into the hellfire. He says, in kafaru bi ayatina." Those who deny, those who reject our signs, سوف نصليهم نارا كلما نضجت جلودهم بدلناهم جلودا غيرها ليذوق العذاب إن الله كان عزيزا حكيما. Indeed, those who deny our signs, we will drive them into a fire. Every time their skins, and again, this is very graphic, every time their skins are roasted through, we will replace them with other skins so that they may taste the punishment. Now, of course, we know today that, that uh, you know, the skin is, is the largest organ and it's, it's really the center of uh, a lot of... Uh, the, the nerve endings. So perhaps this the replacing of the, the skin, uh, because if the skin is completely burned, you, you lose your ability to, to feel. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces it because again, the, the punishment is not reduced for these people. We will replace them with other skins so that they may taste the punishment because when the skin is completely burned, you lose, you become numb. And then at the end of the verse, and it's, it's very interesting here, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَزِيزًا hakima. Indeed, God is ever exalted in might. And of course, Jahannam, the hellfire, the fact that these criminals are being punished, 
that they have been captured, they're punished, is a manifest manifestation of God's izza, God's power. That all these people who have escaped, many of them who have escaped justice in Alam dunya now they are imprisoned by the Almighty. In Allah kana aziz and hakima, but Allah is not only Jahannam is not only a manifestation of God's power. It's also a manifestation of Allah's hikmah. It's a manifestation of God's wisdom. So even if you and I, we don't understand why this, why the punishment is so severe or why these particular punishments are being doled out to these people. And why is it that the punishment is not lessened? Allah is saying that this is all based on my hikmah, on my wisdom. I know what I created. I know my creation. I know I am more familiar with these people. I'm more familiar with them than you are. So Jahannam, according to this ayah, is a reflection, is a manifestation of God's might and his wisdom. Now this type of punishment, and we have to be very precise in our understanding of this ayah. Allah says thus, meaning everything that was mentioned in this ayah, you know, the fact that the, the punishment is not lessened, that, you know, there is no escape for them. Thus do we recompense every stubborn rejecter. Now, kafur should look familiar to another word that, 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 we're, that we're familiar with, and that is kafir. So we have kafir and we have kafur. So this punishment, this severe, unrelenting punishment, it seems that it's not for all people. It's for a very specific category of, uh, of kuffar. And that is the, the one who is kafur. So you have kafir, the one who rejects. And then you have kafur, who is excessive in their rejection. Meaning that this is a person who is a kafir in, in every respect of the word. This is a person who has rebelled and rejected their own conscience. They, def they have defied God and they have rejected every opportunity for salvation and redemption. They're kafur. You know, it's, it's, it's similar to the word sabr and sabur. Sabr is someone who's patient. Sabur is someone who's extremely patient. A kafir is someone who rejects. Kafur is someone who is so excessive in their rejection. They All they do is reject. And their rejection, their denial of God and his signs is not an epistemological issue, meaning that their rejection is not based on a lack of information, ins insufficient information. Their, their rejection is actually purely out purely based on, on arrogance. I'm sorry, one second. So they have rejected anything and everything related to God purely out of arrogance and rebelliousness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be much more lenient with someone who rejects because they were ignorant. Now, in some cases, ignorance is not excused. Sometimes people are lazy and the information was there and they should have put in more effort. But there's a difference between someone who rejects an idea be, due to a lack of information or a lack of knowledge. There's a difference between someone like that and someone who's rejecting purely out of arrogance and rebelliousness, meaning they've already made up their mind that they don't want to accept God and, and therefore they create uh, 
they, they create justifications as to why they, they don't believe, meaning that it's not, it's not based out of a sincere quest for the truth. Verse number 37. <laughs> أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرْكُمْ مَا يَتَذَكَّرُ فِيهِ مَنْ تَذَكَّرُ وَجَاءَكُمُ النَّذِيرُ فَذُوقُوا فَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ نَصِيرُ They will cry out therein, O oh Lord. So who's crying? The people of, of Jahannam. They cry out, Our Lord, remove us, that we may work righteousness other than what we used to do. And then the, the answer comes back to them from Allah. Did we not give you a long life? Enough for, who, for whosoever would reflect to reflect. And the warner has come to you. So taste the punishment. The wrongdoers shall have no helpers. Now, what's interesting here is that and you'll see that this is a common theme in the Qur'an. All of the inhabitants of Jahannam acknowledge that they were indeed mischievous and wicked. You know, if you go to any prison today or any jail, you know, as they say, jail is, is full of, of innocent people. You know, if you talk, oh, they all, they all claim to be innocent. But Jahannam is not like, like prison in dunya. All of them. Without exception, they all acknowledge that they, they were wrong, that they were in the wrong. In fact, this is a very interesting ayah in the Quran in Surah Al-Sajda, ayah number 12, where Allah gives us a snapshot of the Day of Judgment. وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذِ الْمُجْرِمُونَ نَاكِسُوا رُؤُوسِهِمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ If you could but see when the criminals are hanging their heads before their Lord. You can imagine that day. These tyrants and these corrupt people who used to boast and who used to be so arrogant on the day of judgment, they will be lowering their heads in humiliation. And what will they say? Rabbana absarna wa sami'na. Our Lord, we have seen and we have heard, meaning that we know, we know the reality. So return us. They all ask to go back, to go back to dunya. Let us go back so we can do one good deed. We can do something good. So this shows that they, they come to the world, world of the hereafter and they're completely bankrupt. Meaning the fact that they're going back so we can do salihan, even one good deed, indicates that these are people who have done nothing good in their lives. Everything that they've done has ba been based on their own selfish interests. Indeed, we are now certain of the truth. So they want to go back. And this is, again, there are many verses in the Quran where after people die on the day of judgment, they make this request, this plea to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to send them back. Now, this is all, of course, this is impossible. It's impossible to go back to Alam al dunya because the hu human beings were on this ongoing journey, this progression towards our final destination. It's impossible to go back in the same way. And this is it's analogous to, you know, to the idea that is it possible to put an infant back into the womb after, after they've been delivered? You can't because now you, with, with, with your lungs functioning physiologically, you cannot even survive in the womb because you're you're you've you're at a new phase in your journey in your existence. So similarly, someone who who is in the hereafter, they're not they're not able to. Of course, if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala intervenes, that's a separate story, especially with respect to raja. But as a general rule of thumb, this is something that that goes against the the natural law. Of God to be able to go back after crossing 
over into the hereafter is something that is is impossible unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows it. So, and also an, another reason why this request is problematic is the souls of people have acquired, you know, generally they've acquired permanent qualities, meaning that after death and on the day of judgment, you've gone so far in your journey that there are certain qualities that have solidified and they're now a part of your nature and your essence, whereby even if you were to be sent back, you're going you're gonna to behave in accordance with your own nature, the nature of your soul. So it's, it's frivolous, it's useless to send someone back after they've reached a point in their maturation where their, their soul has become fully developed and their nature is pretty much uh, fixed. And this is why if you look at the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is, we covered this when we uh, discussed Surah Al-An'am way back in the past. Allah says, ruddu." Again, they make a request to go back to dunya. This is after they see Jahannam. This is after they, they, you know, they're in some cases they might even be in Jahannam. Allah says, even if they were sent back after seeing death and barzakh and qiyama and Jahannam, now you would think that should have been the ultimate wake up call. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if they were sent back, they would return to the very thing they had been forbidden. Indeed, they are liars. And I think, brothers and sisters, that if it wasn't for this ayah, maybe we would have wondered that maybe if these people were given a second chance, maybe after seeing death and witnessing the day of judgment, if they go back, maybe they would, they would walk on the straight path. But Allah tells us that they're liars. And this is something that's shocking. I mean, this is a verse in the Quran that until today, I find it to be one of the most, one of the most astounding verses in the Quran. And it shows you that, that people, that people, that, that people's souls, even after, even after witnessing hellfire that people will still succumb to their to their desires rabbana akhrajna i think there's a typo here rabbana akhrajna yeah rabbana akhrajna na'mal salihan ghayra alladhi kunna na'mal so they 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 plea they beg allah Remove us that we may work righteousness. Other than what we used to do. Now commentators note that the word salihan is an indefinite noun. And the, the idea here is, and I've already alluded to this, that these people did not bring forth a single good deed in the hereafter. They have nothing. There are people who will live a full life and they will meet Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment and they have not done a single good deed. Meaning even if they, even if outwardly it seems that they did good, the intentions were not pure. It was done for selfish reasons. So here they're asking Allah to be sent back to have the opportunity to do a work of righteousness, a single good deed. And this shows you how, how impactful one single good deed is. What the, they're willing to go back just so they can perform one good deed. Because everything, every good deed on the day of judgment has value. You know, perhaps because of one good deed, Allah Azza wa Jal may pardon you, may show you mercy. It could be one good, one good deed that qualifies someone for shafa'ah 
for intercession. So these people were completely devoid of any goodness in their lives and they acted entirely based on their selfish interests. So this is the request. Oh Allah, remove us, take us out of Jahannam and send us back to dunya so we can do a righteous act. Now what is the answer? So Allah responds to them and it seems that the response is through the angels, through the keepers of hell because one of the the most severe punishments of Jahannam is that the people of Jahannam are not given direct access to God, meaning that they are barred from addressing Allah directly. So God responds to their request with two rhetorical questions. The first is, أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرُكُمْ مَا يَتَذَكَّرُ فِيهِ مَنْ تَذَكَّرُ were you not given ample time to reflect and discover the truth? We have to appreciate our time, brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I gave you sufficient time to discover the truth, to discover at least a part of the truth, to reflect and to think at the very least that I have a creator and I must have a purpose. You know, unfortunately, there are people who live their entire lives like robots. And they don't think for a single moment about the origin of the universe. They don't think that, you know, th does, my, does life have any meaning? Ask, asking some of these fundamental questions. Allah is saying that were you not given enough time to reflect, to at least think about your purpose, to think, that you have a creator, that this, this universe was not created in vain. And if you look at the, the average lifespan of a person, you know, based on the global average, you, the average human being lives about 72 years. So this is the, the global average. So your average person is going to live over 70 years. Allah is saying that, isn't this sufficient time for you? to at least discover some realities, to at least come to a definitive conclusion about whether you have a creator or not. But most people are they're distracted or they just don't care. So number one, were you not given ample time? And number two, did you not take heed from the numerous warners I sent to you during your life? Now, and the warner has come to you. Now, some commentators say that this refers to prophets. But I think based on, and this is what other Mufassirin say, that the Nadir could be any type of warning that God sends. You know, there's, uh, you know, speaking about uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us ample time to discover the truth. There's a, an interesting hadith here from Imam al-Sadiq. He says, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَفِي فَسْحَةٌ مِّنْ أَمْرِهِ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةٌ Imam al-Sadiq says, when a person reaches the age of 40, Meaning that from, from the day that you're born until the age of 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is lenient with you. You're still religiously accountable, but it seems that up until the age of 40, which is when, you know, generally when people reach full uh, mental maturity because of ex life experience and so on, فَإِذَا بَلَغَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً أَوْ حَلَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِلَى مَلَكَيْنَ When a person reaches the age of 40, God reveals to his two angels who record his deeds. إِنِّي قَدْ عَمَّرْتُ عَبْدِي عُمْرًا فَغَلِّضَ وَشَدِّدَ 
وتحفظ واكتب عليه قليل عمله وكثير وصغيره وكبير I have allowed Allah says to the angels I have allowed my servant to reach a sufficient age whereby it is now suitable to be firm and strict with him meaning that there is a higher level of accountability because of your age because of your experience so record the little, the many, the minor, and the, the major. Now, of course, there is accountability even before the age of 40. But when you hit the age of 40, it seems that there is, there is a higher level of, of scrutiny and expectation because of a person's life experience. And of course, it doesn't exactly have to be the age of 40. But the point is that when you reach you know, this middle age, there is a higher expectation of you. Uh, in another hadith, when Imam al-Sadiq was asked about this part of the verse, أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرْكُمْ that, Did we not give you a long life enough for you, enough for whosoever would reflect to reflect? Imam al-Sadiq, he says, تَوْبِيْخٌ لِبْنِ ثَمَانِيَةَ عَشَرْ سَنَةً That this is a rebuke for a person of 18 years of age. Now, you may think that, isn't this a contradiction? So, now... When you become baligh, of course, you're religiously accountable. But the the degree to which you are held accountable, meaning the, the strictness of your of your hisab, is also related to your age. So someone who is 40, 50, 60 years old, when they commit sins, you know, if, if a 50-year-old commits zina and an 18-year-old commits zina, who do you think Allah is going to be more strict with? You know, someone who's young, who has hormones who's inexperienced or someone who's 50 60 years old Allah Azza wa is gonna is gonna be much more critical and he's gonna hold them to a more uh he's gonna they're gonna be held more accountable before God by virtue of their life experience that your life experience should have taught you something that these are things that should have there should be avoided there are there are risks to this type of behavior so th there's a spectrum that we see that as we get older, it seems that our accountability, our ex God's expectation of us increases as we increase uh, with age. Because we should be learning from our life experiences. In Surah Al-Mulk, again, there are two things that, that are mentioned here when, the, uh, when, when people enter the hellfire. You know, they admit their guilt. وقالوا, and they, they have, you can hear this remorse and this regret in their tone. وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلْ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ And they will say, the inmates of hell, they will say, if only we had been listening or reasoning, we would not be among the companions of the blaze. نَسْمَعْ If only we had been listening, meaning listening to revelation. Naqil is, so you have, there are two things that cause people to enter Jahannam. They don't listen to revelation. They don't listen to prophets and messengers or imams. And the second problem is, so even if there is no revelation, there is still something that can allow you to attain some degree of salvation. And that is to use your reason. So even if someone was never exposed to the light of revelation it doesn't mean that they're they're not accountable before god so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold you accountable for those things that your reason was able to decipher sometimes your aql dictates decrees that this this behavior should be avoided you know so someone can say that you know i never i, I was never exposed to islam and therefore you know i i should be forgiven for murdering so there are certain crimes which should be avoided on the basis of reason. So even if someone had no familiarity with revelation, they, they, there's still a criterion of judgment for them. And that is the aql, the intellect. And this is why Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam, he says, Inna Allah ala nasi hujjatain. Verily God has two authoritative proofs over people. A manifest proof 
and an inward proof. And hujjah here, it means that thing that allows you to know what the will of God. Prophets, they communicate the will of God. And your aql and your intellect, your conscious also points you towards the, the will of God. So our aql, and this is, this is the beauty of especially the Shia tradition, is that there is um, revelation and rationality always go hand in hand. Whatever religion decrees, reason, if it had full information, it would decree the same. Whatever judgment the, the reason makes, religion will make the same judgment. And whatever judgment religion makes, the intellect, reason, will make the same judgment. And that's assuming that, that the intellect is given full information, is given all the information. So the manifest proof is represented by the by the prophets and the messengers and imams, and the inward proof proof is represented by the intellects. And verse number 38, very quickly. In Allah Alimu Ghaib Samawati Wal Ard. Indeed, God is knower of the unseen aspects of the heavens and earth. Indeed, he is aware of that which is within the chests. Now, those verses where we spoke about the punishment of hell, it may seem very harsh. It may seem excessive. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, He reminds us that He knows what is hidden from us. He knows what He knows the unseen of the heavens and the earth. And because He is the knower of the unseen, He knows what is in the hearts of the people. You and I, we judge based on what is apparent. We judge on based on what is visible. You may see someone and you may think that this is a good person. But Allah Azza wa Jal, He knows what is within the hearts. And because He is well acquainted with our innermost thoughts, He knows what's in our hearts. This is what makes Him the ultimate judge. And He is the, the one who is qualified to be the arbiter, the judge. So when He rewards, it's based on his wisdom and knowledge because he knows the purity of that heart. And when he punishes, and when he punishes severely, and if he dooms someone to eternal punishment, it's based on his knowledge and it's based on his infinite wisdom. Uh, with that, I think we'll uh, conclude. I suspect that we'll be able to finish uh, the tafsir of Surat Fatr uh, probably by next week, if not uh, the week after that. So one or two more sessions, and inshallah, we will conclude uh, the tafsir of this surah. Wa akhra da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad. If there are any questions or comments... So uh, I apologize for any of the the background noise. I don't I don't have the the liberty to to yell at any of the kids. So, <laughs> oh no, no worries. So, uh, why should heaven and hell, or a system of rewards and punishments, be related to selfishness or self love or self infatuation? The two categories seem to be irrelevant. Uh, what is the relationship? So I, I don't think I understood the question. What 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 exactly was the question? So it's basically trying to uh, trying to understand why uh, heaven and hell are related to selfishness or self infatuation. What what's the relationship between those two things? Why why hell is related to selfishness? Uh, I believe so. That's what seems to be the question. <clears throat> Well, I mean, my selfishness would have someone end up in hell. I mean, it, it, it depends on what we mean by, we have to first, we have to define what we mean by 
by selfishness. Now, you know, every human being in their nature is going to do what's in their interests. But to do what is in your actual interest is, is something that Allah is inviting us towards. So when we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we help others, we're actually doing what is in our interest. So this is, you know, a positive type of selfishness, meaning that, you know, we're doing what is best for us. And what is best for us is to obey God and to treat his creation with, with reverence and compassion. Now, the, the negative uh, and the, the, the condemnable uh, selfishness is that it's that perceived, it's to operate on the basis of, of what you perceive to be immediately beneficial to you. And it, it's not something that, that, that has actual true benefit. So for example, you know, from a spiritual perspective, to donate money is, is, is an act of self-love, that you're doing it for your own. So you're deferring, you know, gratification, immediate gratification for the sake of securing eternal happiness. And that is, you know, which is, which is through the act of sadaqah. A selfish person would say that I'm not going to give charity. I'll keep the money for myself. In reality, they're, they think that they're doing something that's beneficial to themselves. But in reality, this is a, 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 this is a perceived benefit that they think that they're acquiring. That by holding on to those funds and spending on myself, it is perceived that they're doing something that benefits them. But in reality, they're depriving themselves of something that is, that is truly beneficial, that is going to have an enduring uh, impact on their, uh, on their prosperity. So when we say that, you know, Jahannam is a place it, it, that when we, we speak about selfishness and that Jahannam is a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes people for, for their, their sins and for, for acquiring wicked traits. So if by selfishness we mean that you're, you're succumbing to those, those behaviors that you, you falsely perceive to be beneficial to you, this is what we mean by selfishness. But all human beings operate on the basis of self-love. We all do what we think is to our benefit. Now, the beauty of Islam is that Islam teaches us what is truly beneficial and advantageous uh, to us. Because sometimes re what has real value and, what, and what, we, what we perceive to have value are two very different things. Uh, uh, thank you. And um, if we make our own hell and hell is of our making uh, in the hereafter, is it heaven the same way? Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, we have a hadith about how our actions are the raw materials for the, the, uh, the blessings of paradise. You know, there are hadith that, you know, when the prophet went on Mi'raj and he saw paradise, he saw that Malaika were constructing the abodes and the dwellings of the believers who will be admitted. And he, the Prophet saw that sometimes they build diligently and then suddenly they stop. So the Prophet asked them, why is it that I see you working diligently and then suddenly you stop? And they told the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, we are waiting for materials. So meaning that our good deeds are essentially the raw materials. In that, in that higher realm, that what we do now is actually creating uh, that, uh, that, parad that paradisal world. So Jahannam is a product of our actions. It's a reflection of the human soul. And so is par so there is no Jannah without Ahl al-Jannah, and there is no Jahannam without the people of Jahannam. So they, they both are, uh, are projections of each other. Now, uh, this question is about Surah 32, verse 12, where people are asking to be returned back to the, to the world and said they'll be righteous. Yes. If 
their souls have acquired permanent qualities at this point, they've solidified their nature, uh, wouldn't that imply that Hellfire would not be able to, or at least have a very, very hard time redeeming them and making them fit to exit hell? So, so again, we're, when we're talking about a very specific group of people. And these are, these are those, because if, if you recall, what's, what's the request that they're making? They want to go back so they can do a single good deed, meaning that they, they have nothing to show for. So these are the most wicked of the wicked. Now, most people will not be like that. So most of, even among the disbelievers, many of them are not going to be like that. They will have, and this is why many of them may even qualify for, for some type of uh, shafa'a. There might, there might be something that can be done. But uh, those people, because they have no goodness in them, they're, uh, they're, they're people that really can't be rehabilitated. Whereas, the, whereas there might be people who enter hellfire, but their spiritual diseases are not that severe, meaning that they can undergo a, uh, a, uh, a, a sort of spiritual purification. They can be rehabilitated. Thank you. And uh, I guess this is one uh, comment uh, someone left, just that uh, there are people uh, who believe in God supposedly, but are really evil, kind of like Zionists. So it's just simply having faith in God doesn't seem to make people moral or ethical. So, you know, when we say someone believes in God, but doesn't... Uh, you know, we have to define what we mean by that. Is you know, you know, there are some people who, who claim to believe in God, but if, if nothing in their behavior uh, reflects that belief, can we even say that that's a true belief? Because if you really believe something, you know, it, it's like if I tell you that this you have an illness and this pill will cure your illness. Can you say that I believe this pill will cure me, but I'm not going to take it? If you believe that it's going to cure you, you would take it. So beliefs need to be reflected in our actions. So there are, there are many people that may claim to believe in God, but only Allah knows who really believes in him. And, and therefore, you know, we, can, we might be able to cite some examples. Like Saddam. Saddam claimed to, be, to believe in God. He held a copy of the Qur'an. There are some Muslims that even say that, you know, before they, before they, they, uh, they hanged him, he, he said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasul. So there are some people that think he's from Ahlul Jannah because he recited the kalima. Now, did this belief in God, can, can we see it reflected in his behavior? So we don't know. We have to leave these, uh, these decisions to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what we do know is that, you know, typically when someone truly believes something, there should be a sign of it in the way that they conduct themselves. So a belief is not just an idea. A belief should also shape and, uh, and guide uh, our actions. So there may be many people who claim to believe in God, but deep down in their hearts, they, uh, they, don't, they don't actually believe.